Good morning. Good morning. Yes, ma'am. Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Myself, Dr. Varsha Mane. Good morning once again, and I welcome all the dignitaries and participants in today's national webinar. Recently, the Union Cabinet approved a new education policy on July 29, 2020, with an aim to produce several changes in the Indian education system. Full to college level, making India as a global knowledge power. After a long period of three decades, a big transformation to the Indian education system that is the beginning of a new era in the education system of India. Putting more emphasis on practical knowledge on the part of students. So today, Asia is one of the leading institute, Raj Shikshan Sangstha, founded by Padma Bhushan Dr. Karmavir Bhavra Patil. first established chhatrapati shivaji college satara and one of the branch patan college vita organize national webinar on national education policy 2020 related to higher education first of all i welcome our enthusiastic innovative and leading personality our beloved principal of chhatrapati shivaji college satara and secretary of raj shikshan sangstha honorable dr v s shivan kar sir also i welcome former dean of science faculty and academic council member of shivaji university kolapur and excellent speaker great critic and inspiring teacher honorable principal dr cj khilare sir i welcome today's resource persons honorable dr jagannath dange sir and dr ashok rane sir to begin with session first about national policy related to higher education and resource person of the session first is honorable dr jagannath dange sir dr jagannath dange sir is a associate professor and chairman of the department of pg studies and research in education at kuwempu university karnataka he is an educationist an excellent speaker writer and inspiring teacher working for education social equality and women empowerment Dr Jagannath Dange sir was the director of Center for Ambedkar and Buddhist Studies and also coordinator of health education programs and advisory board member for career and counseling sale he was a member of curriculum development committee for two year bed teacher education program constituted by higher education council karnataka state he also developed a life skill model based on world health organization proposed Ten life skills. Dr. Jagannath Dange sir has published eleven books and developed blended learning material for B.Ed course in collaboration with Commonwealth of Learning Canada, and also published two thousand twenty nine research and conceptual papers in reputed national and international journals and magazines. He is a columnist and writes articles for newspapers. Dr. Dange sir is a working as international peer review com committee member for 11 international online journals ugc listed journals and advisory board member for couple of international journals he has delivered 250 special lectures on different themes of teaching learning evolution and paradigms of education he is also a district research advisory committee member of a diet at shimoga karnataka He has also participated in All India Radio programs for Bhadravati Station. Honorable Dr. Jagannath Dange sir received Chintan Guide Teacher Award and Chintan Organizing Teacher Award in 2004. He was honored with Karnataka State Dr. B R Ambedkar Ratna Award for 2018 and Indian Ideal Citizen Award, Karnataka Bhushan Award and Karnataka Basava Jyoti Award in 2019. he is also founder of a janahit sabha forum in karnataka state so i would like to request honorable dr jagannath dange sir to put his deliberations uh thank you very much uh, dr varsha mane madam for giving my brief introduction to the uh, audience as well as the dignitaries hope i am audible uh good morning to you all uh 
<clears throat> first and foremost i would like to remember uh, the great visionary soul uh, bhavra patil ji for his vision to establish educational institutions so that the good society would be expected to education uh rayat shikshan sansthas chhatrapati shivaji college satara and balwant college vita department of education have organized a collaborative program that's national webinar on national education policy 2020 in special reference to higher education i would like to congratulate and thank the organizing team for organizing such a wonderful program a need based program and few dignitaries i have to mention here the honorable dr vital tivankar dr anil kumar bavre dr ashok rane dr seema marje and the most important the head of the department of education dr varsha mane madam as well as the bharbu marje sir and all the other dignitaries faculty members management personals as well as the dignified participants we all know that there is a lot of discussion going on in this country discussion in the field of education especially right from elementary to higher education everybody is talking about a policy which we have seen almost 34 years after 34 years of gap we have seen an education policy which has highlighted almost all the areas and want to make this country a real challenging one so that the world would see india in terms of the youth which is empowered in terms of skills and competencies and the honorable prime minister has rightly mentioned that so after the initiation or acceptance of this policy there must be conclaves around the country so that all the stakeholders it may be the higher education teachers or the students research scholars and not only just the students and teaching faculty there must be a deliberation from parents as well as the non government organizations so that how best we can make use this policy a good policy and what best the mechanisms can be adopted so that we can implement quite emphatically and expect a good cherished country in the future so that is all the vision of the honorable prime minister as well as the all dignitary who have worked for this policy and in continuation with that or in carrying out the same work the two important societies they thought that this kind of deliberation and discussion is required at higher education so that we can think we can introspect and we can help in preparing the mechanisms also so that this policy would be implemented easily and effectively so that's what all the gist of the program as well as the policy which i am putting in front of you so now i would like to present my views with the help of this powerpoint presentation so that it will be very useful and easy to understand the different aspects of the policy what it is saying about the higher education what would be the structure of higher education by adopting this policy and what challenges we may face in terms of implementation as well so that is very important thing so the way of 
adopting it is the need of the art. So how best we prepare the mechanisms and what problems we may come across when we implement this will also be covered in my presentation. So I am not criticizing any policy or I am not saying that it's exactly the very much good thing which requires no changes or no uh, lacunas or the bottlenecks. Definitely policies are always good. We have seen last three policies. They are great. They have helped the India in modification and improvement the, ma the ma human resource. So in similar way, this policy is also having a global vision. Global vision by adopting all the Indian culture as well. It has given due importance to the Indian culture as well as it talks about the vision for the next 25 years. So I would like to keep in front of you all those ideas in my slides and see how best this would be definitely helpful for the next generation of the youths. Hope my PPT is visible to you all. Shall I proceed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yes. We all know that uh, the draft was presented in 2019 and the main important issues it covered or it wants to address the challenges of education are five important components. One is the accessibility. Second one is equity. Third one is quality. Fourth one is affordability. And fifth one is accountability. It's very much keen in addressing these challenges of education for the, especially the high education system for the next generation. We can address easily if any problems may come across in implementation of the plan. That is very important. And we all know that on 29 July 2020, a 60 page document was presented to the reporters and final calculation was done and it had been added to the website of 66 pages. And one important thing is the full document is not yet released. Full document yet to be released and all the body members are saying that the, we are thinking of the mechanisms, how best the mechanisms will be developed and based on those mechanisms by having a lot of deliberations across the country we would prepare that and we will prepare the complete document. So that is uh, the stage of uh, presentation of the National Education Policy 2020. And the main highlights, if you see, there is a recognized committee who have contributed significantly to the education field and research as well, uh, headed by K. Kasturi Ranganji, who was a chairman of the policy and the rest of the people who have worked are very much competent enough in developing a very sound educational uh, policy for this country. And it has conducted a lot of uh, consultations with the different organizations. It had consulted 216 eminent individuals, as well as it had taken the important components of 1968 policy, 1986, as well as 1992. So all those important elements have been extracted and taken care of uh, addressing those issues in this policy as well. It has also said that they have, uh, they have taken the important inputs from TSR Subramaniam Committee report as well. So a lot of feedback has been taken, a lot of care has been taken in developing this policy by uh, considering the important inputs of earlier policies as well. And the Kasturi Rangan has rightly mentioned that in one of the, his uh, uh, address uh, while presenting this policy, we want to create a just and equitable society in this country. So that was the word, words of Kasturi Ranganji. And the policy also intended to create a just and equal society. Uh, and Another important aspect they highlighted that uh, the 21st century goals we want to reach. We want to reach those goals by keeping our traditions as well as value systems intact. We don't want to lose those traditional values and we want to reach those 21st century 
skills and competencies as well so it this policy is a amalgamation of values as well as the 21st century skills and this policy is very important the reason why is it looks for the next two decades what the world is requiring from the youths it is very much concentrated on that and it is saying that the society is changing social economic industrial and cultural aspects so, so that we can retain our value system as well as we can grab all those opportunities uh, which we are expecting through those societal changes and it is also talking about the technology use extensive use of technology and ubiquitous use of technology is the vital element of this policy i it's also talking about the industrial revolution the fourth industrial revolution which is going to happen and we would like to prepare our youth for that revolution so that they can gain more and more job opportunities and employment rate would be increased i the very best thing of this policy is the sustainable development it's talking about the sustainable development and lifelong learning opportunities so age will not be a barrier in the learning process so everyone must get an opportunity to learn the things whenever they want so that's what the sustainable development uh, it's talking about and it wants to find the solutions for four important problems one is eliminate the problems of pedagogy what is the teaching learning process which requires a sound methodology it's talking about that second one it's talking about the structural inequalities how to find the solutions to inequalities third thing it is also striving hard to assess the asymmetries or the irregularities which are there in the higher education or in education system and the fourth important element it is talking about the rampant commercialization education is becoming a commercial good now so how to overcome that how best to provide all opportunities to every individual of this country it is talking about and any visionary document we all know that uh, which has been presented uh, in the uh, in the parliament don't know what discussion will be done but prior to that they want to have a clear mechanisms for its adaptation and it also says that in its vision india must be a vibrant country vibrant country in terms we would like to develop and we would like to give the quality education inventions must be more in india and importance must be given to the research so that we can make a vibrant country in the world that's the vision of nep and second important thing uh, re regarding the shortage of manpower it's saying that we don't want to have a shortage of manpower either it may be science or technology or academic or industry so in all those areas we want to prepare our youth so that everyone will get an opportunity to work and empower this country so that's the vision of of uh, gdp and it's also talking about the sustainable development as i rightly mentioned that learning is not just for the uh, earning or for the um, employment opportunity it is for the lifelong learning it is for the living in a very happy environment or uh, living in a socially well being so that is the very ideal of this policy and it is also talking about the multidisciplinary education multidisciplinary means any learner or any student can choose any kind of a subject if somebody is learning a science stream means there will be no streams at all in future streams will be merged the uh, the graduate student can take one from science stream and one subject from social science stream and one subject from commerce stream so that multidisciplinary aspect will be introduced in education and it it is also highlighting that there must be a caring and sharing so each and everyone should care about the resources and share about the resources 
So sharing and caring are the part of or the base of this NEP document and it is intended to develop world-class higher education institutions and they must be culturally strong. And youth should contribute for India for economic and political transformation as well as the social transformation. And there is a single body which is regulating all the higher education bodies and that's the reason why it says that there will be a light but tight regulation and grow in their achievements. So that lightness will be given in the performance of the institution, but there will be a regulatory body which is very tight in its function or regulatory. So that is what it is all saying about. And it also says that foreign universities would be provided opportunity to work in this country. So here it is saying that it is not just the Indian uh, institutions or the universities or, or the multidisciplinary institutions, they work in this country. This uh, policy will provide an opportunity to invite the foreign universities as well. And there will be four year undergraduate degree program and options will be given at various stages for the entry as well as exit. So which means any learner who want to join the undergraduate program means after one year of undergraduate program, he can exit or second year of undergraduate program, he can exit. So exit, multiple exit and entry opportunity uh, will be given to the learners at higher education institutions for their courses and there will be a credit transfer system as we are now seeing the same thing will be continued as well as but phd will be there there will be no mphil program so mphil program will be abolished and just few overviews i have brought so that we can understand very easily how and what things it has told about the school education also so that we can link well with the higher education. So it is talking about the quality early childhood education. So three to six years of childhoodness will be added till 2025. And every student in grade five and beyond will achieve the foundational literacy and numeracy till 2025. And there will be a new pedagogical structure and learning structure in the school that is five plus three plus three plus four and there will be an integrated and flexible school uh, curriculum and there is no hierarchy of subjects. We cannot uh, impose on students that science subjects are very hard and very important and social science subjects are very easy. No, there is no segregation of uh, uh, subjects at all and there is no hierarchy of subjects uh, at all. So every subject will be given importance due so that the learners will learn quite comprehensively all the subject in a very easy manner. And till 2030, there will be 100% gross enrollment ratio uh, at secondary level and effective governance of those schools through school complexes. So let me highlight the very important glimpses which are there in the National Education Policy 2020. It is saying that very clearly, India wants to have a gross education ratio 50% till 2025. Right now we are at 26% and it want, uh, wants to have 50% of gross enrollment ratio of higher education till 2025. That's a vision. And it also wants that higher education should contribute for the sustainable livelihoods as well as the economic development of this country. And it has rightly mentioned that whatever the constitutional values we have imbibed, we are trying to have them, inculcate them among the youth. This policy should help hold the education sector to inculcate all those values. It may be the self-awareness, culture, human nation, socially conscious, liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice for all. So this is a very big vision 
whatever the constitution is having and the same thing wants to have through the education system that is the vision of national education policy 2020 and india wants to build the expertise that society will need for the next 25 years so whatever society requires the education should provide it for the next 25 years so that kind of expertise the education system needs to be developed among the youth so that is the very intention of nep and whatever the future workplace will demand maybe in terms of the critical thinking communication ability problem solving creativity and multidisciplinary capability must be developed among the youths so these are the important competencies they must be developed through the education system and that is the vision of 2020 nep and it is also mentioning that the single skill and single disciplines need to be eradicated or automated over a period of time and hence it has suggesting that or suggested that the multidisciplinary and 21st century competencies must be focused in higher education so that is the need it is highlighting and identified so that we should have more higher uh, multidisciplinary institutions in the higher education sector and it is telling about the different types of institutions as well so whatever colleges we have maybe the undergraduate and postgraduate colleges and the different universities and research centers we are having they will be converted into multidisciplinary institutions of three kinds it will be a new architecture of higher education the first kind of institutions are research universities research universities will be focused on research and teaching maybe the centrally funded universities as well as the special institutions like iits iim wills will be considered as the research universities and they will be called as the type 1 institutions and it is also saying that over the period of two decades india must have 150 to 300 such institutions and their enrollment would be between 5000 to 25000 which which means on their campuses it is expecting that 5000 to 25000 students will come and study and do the research so this is the first kind of institution that is research universities and second one is teaching universities and their major focus would be on teaching and they can run the courses like professional vocational doctoral undergraduate master courses as well as the diplomas diploma programs as well and they should also conduct research but the major focus would be on teaching in those universities and it is expecting that there will be 1000 to 2000 in your uh, institutions in this country in the next two decades and uh, the enrollment again ranges between 5000 to 25000 and the third kind of a institution is or multidisciplinary uh, higher education institution would be colleges colleges they run the undergraduate programs addition to diploma and certificate programs as well as the vocational and professional pro programs so such institutions will be called as the multidisciplinary institutions which come under the college category it is the type 3 category of institutions and they may be autonomous colleges as well and it is saying that there will be 5000 to 10000 such institutions in the next two decades and their enrollment ranges from 2000 to 5000 and these colleges if they update their competency their credentials definitely they will be allowed to work as type 2 and type 1 institutions as well which means every institution will be having an opportunity to reach the higher level of kind of institution so these three kinds of institution will be there in future 
after adopting this NEP 2020. Then there is a question to be asked for ourselves actually. There are 300, most probably 300 institutions of type 1, 2000 institutions of type 2, 10,000 institutions of type 3. If we combine all those institutions, there would be 12,300 institutions in this country. But right now, we are having 51,649 institutions. In that, 993 universities, 39,000 odd colleges, and 10,000 odd standalone institutions, according to the ICA report. If it is the scenario, do we expect that? Can all these institutions accommodate the higher education students? Almost, uh, almost 3.7 crore uh, higher education students who are taking their education in different institutions across the country. Can these institutions accommodate is a big challenge. And if so, how do institutions accommodate 5,000 to 25,000 students in their campuses? Because uh, the number is very big. Are our institutions, uh, uh, infrastructure is ready or will be prepared in future so that it will accommodate 25,000 of students is a question. And most of our colleges who are, uh, which are working in Taluka and town level, they, they, are, they are having just 2,000 means it's, it's a big task for them also to accommodate such a huge number of students in, in, in those colleges. This is another important question. And when there is a reduction in the number of institutions, how can be there an increase in the enrollment? This is also a question. The policy is saying that we want to have 50% enrollment ratio in 2035. If number will be reduced, how it would be increased in the enrollment ratio? So these are all the issues we have to think and give uh, the suggestions also to the policy so that it will be helpful for them in preparing those mechanisms. This is one aspect. Then it is saying that if any disadvantaged geographies are there, definitely priority will be given for establishing at least one each kind of institutions in every district, which means type one, type two, type three, all the three kinds of institutions will be established within next five years in each and every district, which will come under the disadvantaged geography. So it's a great sign that such districts will be getting more institutions in future. And it is also saying that if, if any undergraduate college, which is not ready to convert itself into a multidisciplinary institution, what will be done? The policy is saying that that institution will be converted into a public library or an adult education center or a vocational education center. But time schedule will be given till 2032 the institution will be given an opportunity to change itself into a autonomous degree granting college or a multidisciplinary university uh, institution. If it is not ready to convert means such institutions would be utilized for public purposes. So this is what the policy is telling. Then it is also telling that the degree granting powers would be vested with individual institutions. Right now universities would give the degrees examination will teaching and examinations will be conducted by the colleges but universities will uh, give the degrees but in future each and every individual multidisciplinary institution will give its own degree it may be a private as well as the government institution if it is so actually see right now we are having 45000 colleges in this country but whereas only 8000 colleges have NAC accredited, which means Indian institutions are lagging behind in getting the accreditations. If the case is so, how can we expect that a college will do all the things which will prepare its own curriculum, it will uh, uh, teach the students, it will uh, conduct the examinations, as well as it will give the degrees. So how to expect that that quality will be brought through all the varieties of uh, institutions. Of course, there are very good private institutions. They are doing, they are doing exceedingly well. They are on par with the private institution, uh, government institutions. But we can we general that all the 
a private one to be asked by ourselves as well as how another important thing is that the policy is saying each and every institution it may be a type 1 type 2 and type 3 all they can give or offer open and distance learning courses distance mode of learning will be allowed by all kinds of institutions then again a challenge arises can our all institutions prepared enough or competent enough to prepare the odl material whether our all teachers who are working in higher education are ready to prepare the odl material is a important task a important issue which will come across by applying this nep 2020 then it is also saying that yes there are lot of programs which have been opted by the youths of this country those are moocs massive open online courses and it is also suggesting that whatever courses the students will take in mooc those credit will be transferred to the regular programs if think that uh, for example one student is taking a post graduate course in a college or a university think that there are eight papers in that course if a student wants to take six courses in regular class and two courses in mooc means that student will be allowed and those two online courses credits will be transferred to the regular courses so the institution has to give a certificate that this student has completed or pursued the credits so that compensation will be there with the help of mooc and again the problem arises in in a country where reachability is very big problem can we reach all the online mode of learning to all the youth of this country is a big challenge because we are having lot of infrastructure problems we are having the problems in relation to the internet and gadgets as well if it is so how to deal with that problem can be a very good challenge for the mooc courses and it is talking about the multidisciplinary higher education institutions and india is known for its talents around the world indian students get an opportunity to work because of their focused talents their specialized talents if these talents would be deviated means if all the special institutions like iisc iim iit aims they are specialized institutions of this country if they will be allowed to work in a multidisciplinary manner can we expect that can we expect that an iisc institution will be offer will be will be given an opportunity to run a ba course or a ma course can we expect that an iit will run a ba course or a post graduate ma course so these are the bottlenecks we are having and we have to resolve them properly before its implementation and it is also very challenging for the the, the uh, state government universities to run the science courses and medical courses so it i don't think it is quite apt to make all the higher education institutions as multidisciplinary institutions so instead of that what we can do is we should uh, be like that only for the specialized institutions and the rest government institutions and other general institutions can be made as the specialized institution so this need to be thought by all the uh, teachers as well as the thinkers of this country and there will be a centralized exit examination for mbbs right now we will be having two examinations one is for the final examination of mbbs and after that there will be entrance examination for ms but after this policy implementation there will be one common exit examination and same examination results would be used for qualifying mbbs as well as for giving uh, 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 admission to the masters as well so that is a great thing it has thought of and it has also made changes in the regulatory bodies as well right now we are having a uh, ugc which is regulating all the higher education bodies but next there will be no ugc instead of ugc there will be a higher education governing council which will distribute the developmental grants and fellowships to all the higher education institutions higher education governing council that's a new council will be 
set up in and uh, UGC will be uh, removed actually. And there is only one regulatory body in this country to regulate all the higher education institutions. That is National Higher Education Regulatory Authority (NHERA), which is the only regulatory body to regulate all the higher education institutions, irrespective of their categories. It may be a professional course, it may be a general course, or any kind of a course. And that is the only regulatory body we will be having. And next thing, we have some regulatory bodies at present, like we call them as uh, the professional regulatory bodies as well, like NCTE, MCI, BCI, and AICT. So these bodies will be there, but they prepare just the standards, that's all. They won't regulate. The regulation will be done by National Higher Education Regulatory Authority. Now the question arises, can a sole body regulate all the higher education institutions is a big challenge. So right now we are having varieties of regulatory bodies. They prepare their regulations and they regulate as well. So in future, there will be one regulatory body means, can we expect that the whole nation's higher education institutions will be regulated by a single body? And is it not a centralization of power is also a point to be thought of. Next, accreditation. Of course, NAC will be there. NAC will prepare its own way of giving accreditation to the uh, 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 higher education institutions. And there will be two kinds of accreditations. For the next 10 year, there will be graded accreditation. Graded means B, B plus, A, A plus, A plus plus. This is graded accreditation. For the next 10 years, definitely there will be graded accreditation. And after 10 years, by 2030, there shall be only a yes or no type of accreditation. We call it as binary accreditation. So which means you are, our, our institutions will be given whether accredited or not accredited. That's all. There will be no grades at all. Until 2020, a choice will be given to the institutions to go for whether the graded accreditation or binary accreditation. So this is a change in the accreditation. Next, it is also talking about the liberal education. Liberal education means liberal notion of arts, which means in the uh, uh, probably uh, in 1400 years ago, Banabhatta Kadambari. So a very good uh, unique novel which, which has stated that if a person who will be called as educated means should have 64 kalas, 64 arts, and those arts must be there with every individual who come out of the higher education. So that was the intention of this policy. And they are saying that a student should come out of higher education in different streams as well by having a competency. If somebody wants to learn a music means we will, he will be given an opportunity to learn music, dance, painting, sculpture, language, literature with the science subjects as well as the social science subjects. So which means if anybody wants to learn any kind of a content, any kind of a subject according to his or her interest means that individual would be provided an opportunity at higher education. So that's what teaching 64 kalas making master according to the wish each student is having. So that's what the liberal education is all about. And it is not just the interest a student is having regarding that particular content or a course. The course should also make an individual for different job opportunities, which means if three different subjects a student is learning at higher education means he should get all the three varieties of job opportunities based on his learning of those subjects. So this is what the intention of liberal arts. And it is also giving fair opportunities for the learners for learning, for taking different courses, set of courses, maybe. And each undergraduate courses will be of two kinds, three-year courses as well as four-year courses. 
So four year program will be called as the bachelors of liberal arts or education wherein the each learner has to choose major and minors wo yojana avare gotta you five webinar alle there is a disturbance from the participants please mute your mics okay thank you so there will be two varieties of undergraduate programs three year as well as four year three year the normal bachelor's degree four year will be called as bachelor's of liberal arts or education wherein each and every learner has to choose major as well as minor subjects and there will be a exit opportunity as well if think that a student has completed one year of undergraduate program and he don't uh, he 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 doesn't want to continue means he will be given a one year certificate if after two years he wants to exit means he will be given a diploma certificate after three three years means it's a bachelor's degree and four year completion means it's a honors so such a kind of a multiple exit and entry points will be given for individual learners so that their learning would not be waste if they leave the course in the middle and for the four year undergraduate program one year masters will be there and for three year bachelor's degree there will be two years masters so according to the undergraduate program the masters program will also be developed and it is also saying that there must be merit merit based appointments means faculty positions will be filled on the merit based and the practice of contract employment will be stopped but how and uh, what criteria it will be adopted it has not told anything about that but a rigorous process of evaluation will be done by the students institution leaders committee committees of the peers of their faculties so this is the vital thing it is telling about the appointment as well as uh, the evaluation of teachers who are working in the higher education and it, it is also talking about the fundings all the premier institutions we are having like centrally funded technical institutes central institutes and uh, institutes of na national importance will be considered as the type 1 institutions and they will be funded by the central government also and the financial support would be given to the students as well so that no student will be deprived because of their uh, financial inability and there will be a national scholarship fund also so that e, uh, all the students will get the stipends boarding and lodging facilities as well and there will be no tu uh, tuition fees for such students and the very important thing it is asking from the higher education institutions especially from private sector is each and every private higher education institutions should offer scholarships ranging from 100 to 50 so that is a big thing can we expect all the higher education institutions from private sector to offer scholarships for their students at least 50% next it's also talking about the fees for professional education which will be left to the managements so government will not make any interference in fixing the fees either it is from private or public Uh, uh sector institutions only for uh the professional education courses so which means total freedom is given to the private educational institutions as well as the government education institutions who run the professional courses to fix their fee structure right it is also saying that there are socially and economically weaker sections of students and those students must be given scholarships scholarship from the government as well as from the private management and it is also saying that they will invite 200 top universities of the world to start their courses to start their centers in india now again a challenge comes to the indian higher education institutions that can we compete with those foreign universities next and fees for a course Uh, that's what i told it's talking in one way 
we have to overcome the commercialization of education in other way it is giving permission to all the institutions means can we overcome this problem is also a challenge from gnep 2020 there are additional key focus areas like technology it is telling more about the technology that there will be education national educational technology forum and free exchange of ideas will be there lot of improvement in terms of learning assessment and planning will be done and even all the records will be maintained in a digital form so through the national education technology forum all these things will be done it may be in teaching it may be in learning aspect it may be in administration it may be in management so in every sphere of education uh, uh, technology would be used and it is also talking about the vocational education because just less than 5% of indian workforce in the age group of 19 to 24 have the vocational education when we compare it with the us it is 54% whereas germany 75% and south korea it is 96% so it is giving due importance to the vocational education also it is saying that there will be a integration of vocational education in all the courses so that's a reason or uh, it it has highlighted the liberal education so lok vidya must be taught to the every individual so that they can be trained well in vocational skills as well and it is talking about the adult education there will be a national curriculum framework for adult education and a cadre of adult education centers will be developed across the country so that a large scale public awareness will be generated and as well as it has given due importance to the women's literacy so women literacy is very important and through the adult education it wants to emphasize and increase the literacy level of uh, women through adult education and it is also saying that adequate faculty in every institution must be there and ad hoc and contractual appointments will be stopped and till 2030 there will be a permanent employment track system will be developed so that continuously the appointments will be done in every sphere and there is a promotion of indian languages also so national institute of pali and persian prakrit languages will be set up and lot of translations will be done across the languages so that each and every important knowledge will be disseminated to every individual in their respective languages and it is also talking about the professional education like agriculture universities will be uh, now the stand alone and isolation will be there for every institution so it is saying that these agricultural universities will be integrated universities wherein the learners will learn horticulture livestock agro forestry aquaculture food production systems and so on so all these related uh, aspects of learning will be there in agriculture universities so such uh, isolation of the universities would be reduced or overcome over a period of time and it is also talking about the legal education and it is suggesting that lower court should conduct their proceedings in regional languages not in english but whereas high courts and supreme courts they can continue with the english but where there is a teaching of law students definitely the bilingual education must go on so that they will be well versed in their local language or the state language as well as in the english so it has given importance to the language too and technical education there is no much difference as we are uh, seeing that technical institutions will also be a multidisciplinary institutions where a lot of linkages will be there fundings will be there so it has uh, uh, given a due importance on the new technologies like artificial intelligence 3d machining and uh, uh, genomic studies biotechnology so all these new techniques will be taught in the technical universities or the centers and a new national research foundation will be set up which will give the grants for the research purpose and it is also suggesting that there will be 20000 crores of annual grant from national research foundation irrespective of the fields it wants to highlight or it wants to give preference to all the four major areas like sciences technology social science arts and humanities which means every sector or every field will get equal weightage for the nas uh, funds from the national research foundation and 
there will be a fellowships as well from the national research foundation for students maybe the doctoral fellowships will be there and 500 uh, post doctoral fellowships will be given across the fields and there will be a new ayog that is rashtriya shiksha ayog that is national education commission which is apex body which is headed by or chaired by the prime minister and the union minister of the education will be the vice chairman and the ayog will comprise the eminent educationists researchers union minister uh, ministers and representatives of chief ministers as well so uh, 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 the special ayog which comprised all the members from nation and each state will be asked to set up the rajya uh, shikshak ayog as well as we can call it as the state education commission so that is a new ayog which will be set up and nlp's emphasis on technology again there is a again there is a disturbance okay shall i continue ma'am yes sir yes 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 sir oh, okay okay so just few things which will help us in understanding uh, this policy as well as we can contribute for its implementation as well so we are talking about technology is it yeah, and uh, as we all know that most of the students are from rural background and uh, low socio economic status who come to the higher education can we expect that that equity and inclusion can be brought with the help of technology is a big challenge and uh, there are lot of languages 22 languages which have been included in the eighth schedule of constitution so every language differs can we expect that through this technology we can reach all the languages so media of instruction can also be one of the barrier in implementation of this technological content if we go through the mooc actually there is a need to convert the english content into all the regional languages so that should be the need of the hour. and even the nipa has conducted a study that there will be a big disparity between between rural and urban students in terms of the online learning online classes because most of the rural students will not be in a position to get the infrastructure for their online learning as well as having the internet connectivity so such disparity has to be removed first the government should make such uh, provisions for giving the facilities to the rural masses as well so that they can also learn quite comprehensively through the online mode so this is a very important thing we should consider and in the graded autonomy actually uh, the government is saying that actually state cannot be expected to pay for education to all actually but it is also talking that the uh, the government should invest 6% of gdp on education actually but till today no government has uh, uh, paid or or used 6% of gdp that is also one of the very big problem we are having and rapid expansion of odl uh, can we uh, give all courses through odl is a very big challenge there are professional courses and professional courses cannot be expected that Uh, they would uh, prepare or develop good competencies among the learners through the odl method so this can also be a, a very big problem and as i mentioned i was mentioning that 6% of gd gdp as a public expenditure on education must be made as a law first because unless there will be a law no government or cent, uh, cent, state governments or central government will invest or Uh, keep the fund as uh, for education that's a very important thing because we have seen all those uh, uh, 
uh, expenditure still today means in 2014 it was 3.19 percent and now it is 2.88 percent. So which means almost double uh, percent of uh, GDP we have to keep for education. That is one of the big challenge. I'm telling you. And uh, as we have eight lakh school teachers and fourteen lakh higher education teachers working in this country, we need world class models of training as well. Training is very important for the uh, teachers who are working in the education sector. So there must be a proper plan for training, as well as there must be a fair appointment procedures for teachers at all levels. We are experiencing very hard and. Uh, 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 bad experiences in terms of the appointments. There is there is no appointment at one end, and appointment will be there means always there will be court cases for the appointments. So such uh, procedures need to be overcome, and we should have fair opportunities for the appointments because already our universities are lacking the teachers. 47 percent, Allahabad University 67 percent, AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where we find 80 percent vacant positions. So, which means our higher education institutions are running shortage of teachers, shortage of uh, 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 higher education teachers. So, that's a big alarming uh, thing for the policy to make few suggestions so that there will be a regular appointment and. There should be a uh, private university and multidisciplinary institutes teacher appointment also. So, what would be the representation of women? What would be the representation of retired army or economic weaker sections? So, that aspect has to be there. And even I should also tell that how a vice chancellor would be appointed for private higher education institutions, whether the rules will be same with the government or they will be having a different set of rules. So, those things also be made clear and. The total intention of my presentation is, yes, we the teachers have to think for ourselves first. Ourselves means our teaching profession, our higher education setup, so that we can expect good in terms of the society as well as the notion. So unless we think we grow, definitely no society and nation will be grown on par with the teachers. So thinking, deliberations and expressions are key to reforms. So we should start thinking on the policy we should make more deliberations so that we can express something on that. If it is good, yes, good, of course. If something need to be done based on that means, definitely we will be having an opportunity to express so that we can send those expressions to the higher authorities so that good reforms will be implemented in this country and expect a good education system, which is a, a role model for the entire world. So. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I thank all the organizers and uh, the dignified uh, participants also for bearing me this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable guidance. You have very well explained some of the key aspects of the new education policy. We had a great experience to have you as a resource person.